Um, I'm so glad that you all got to hear what Tom said about his work. Uh, it was a very moving talk, and I just want to say that I'm kind of the opposite <laughs> of him because I don't think about anything before I start. <laughs> I have no goals at all. Everything is, I would say, almost improvisational. Um, the only thing that really isn't improvisational are the images because I have to program those. So I'll talk a bit about what these, these things are. So these are paintings. I work with encaustic, which is wax paint. And if any of you are familiar with encaustic, you'll, you'll say, that doesn't look like encaustic painting because encaustic painting is generally done on wood because it has to be rigid or else it will crack. I've been teaching encaustic painting for about 20 years, so I've gone through like every kind of way you can work with it, and I love encaustic. But for me, I work now on a microfiber paper. It's polyester and nylon, but it, it doesn't rip. And that's important because I sew all over this. And if I were to sew these images on regular paper, just like a postage stamp, it would have so many holes in it that it would right apart, just totally destroy the paper. So in order for me to sew on a painting, I have to sew on something that won't rip. But the effects that I get, if you look at the paintings closely, the effects I can't get by painting with any other material other than encaustic. Because encaustic painting, as I said, is wax, and you, you have to work with it while it's melted. So I'm melting a lot of things into this very absorbent microfiber paper. So if you see like little marbling things, little strange uh, images inside the background, that all happens when I melt those shapes into, into the paper, but everything is wax. Um, so this is encaustic, even though it doesn't look like it, and um, that's, what, that's the material. These uh, embroideries, I don't know whether you took a look up close, but this is all stitching. And the stitching I design on a computer. And the computer I just draw, and sometimes I plan the drawings, and sometimes I just draw right on the computer. But the technology is really the same technology that's used if you've got embroidered uh, jackets or tote bags. Uh, that's what you do. These people, they program these things into, by computer, and then the sewing machines stitch them out. Um, I wanted to do this from the first time I saw it at Judith Solodkin's uh, studio in New York City. She's a master printer, and she would stitch things for artists like Louise Bourgeois, her books to recreate her textile books. Judith would do um, digital renderings of Louise's drawings and um, stitch them out, so I thought I had to do that. Well, I got the materials, the machine, and I had no idea how to use it. So I interned with a commercial embroiderer for a year doing Sikorsky helicopters and Pratt & Whitney engines that we had to render to uh, put on their tote bags and their, their company merch. So it was kind of, I learned the parameters, the technical aspects of doing this machine embroidery before I actually did artwork. So it was a very good grounding in how to think through what a machine can and can't do, including what gets stitched out first, second, third, fourth, 16th, because things need to be in order so that things overlap in the correct way. The edging is done after the backgrounds. Everything has to be done in a sequence. So that's, that takes the longest time of sitting at the computer and deciding what goes where, whether the stitches should be tripled, singled, um, how close they should be together, how far apart. All these things go into uh, coming up with de these designs. And then I'll stitch them out, and sometimes they're a total mess, and they, will, they tangle everything up. So I have to go back and do it again, because there are certain physics involved in how the machine stitches through things and the densities, et cetera. So once I have something that stitches out, that's essentially my drawing. And I can draw this. I can stitch this out a thousand times, 
I can make this purple, but just by changing the thread, I can make that orange. So the colors can change any time I decide to redo this image. I can do it all different ways, depending on you know, whatever the background is. So if this, was, if this were a, a pink background, I might not do pink threads because they might not show up. So once I get the, uh, the design done, I can start to play around with things. But the way my process works is this. In the studio, I will go onto my heated palette and do these paintings. And I don't have any idea what I'm going to do. I just play with colors, with textures, and just see what happens. And I could work for days just making backgrounds. And I, I, I learn about color this way, I learn about all kinds of different things. And then I'm stuck with these backgrounds. So the next thing I would do would be to then embroider an image on here. So I've got to think about an image that won't necessarily be um, in competition with the background that will still read. But again, I'm, I'm picking the colors as I go, because I may have digitized this. This is what this is called, digitizing. I may have digitized this originally in a lot of different colors. So I, I'm making, making the color choices as I go. And then I have this. And then I go back into my box of other paintings that I've made that might not be good backgrounds for embroidery, but I cut them up. I've got all of these different paintings that I can cut. And then I can embellish it with other paintings that I've just cut and shaped. So that's kind of the, um, the process. And this stuff I stitch down on my machine just by choosing stitches and carefully following edges, using motifs on my sewing machines as kind of decorative drawing lines. So it's all very improvisational. I mean, it's an interesting contrast with, with Tom's because he's very much planning and waiting for the, for the inspiration to strike and be very, very committed to something once he's decided to do it. I'm making decisions and figuring it out as I go and just kind of constantly being surprised, like, oh, that would be an interesting thing to do, or, you know, who knows? Let's just try it and, and, and wing it. I never know what anything's going to be until it's actually done. So for example, this is the same um, drawing, but without these little characters and with a whole different um, application of the paintings, of the embellishments. And this is this. This is much bigger, and it's filled in with a crosshatch. So it's constant, for me, it's constant playing. And I really enjoy doing that kind of a thing. Oh, there they are again. And just moving them around and just programming it that way. So um, I'm, I have a BFA in drawing and painting. I can draw super realistically. I have a background in all kinds of, of art making things but I've always liked the craft aspect of it. I'm very tall, so I've been sewing my clothes since I was like seven years old because they didn't really make clothes my size when, back in the 60s. So I've always wanted to be able to use my painting and my crafting, dare I use the word, together. I hook rugs, textiles are very, very important to me. So this to me, at this stage in my career, I'm very happy to be able to um, be able to use my sewing and my, my encaustic painting, which I absolutely love, and just be able to play and be joyful and uh, create these stories uh, that I never know what the story is until the, uh, the picture is finished. And they're kind of strange characters in strange worlds. I think that that's why I named the, the show Strange Lands, because you kind of know what's going on, but you kind of don't. These things look familiar, but not necessarily something that you really know. Like these kind of look like TVs, but they're kind of alive at the same time. And, uh, and, and I only think about what the painting is about when it's, when it's done. So these, I thought they looked like they were like jumping on a bouncy castle 
It was all kind of jumping around. Um, so uh, that's, that's what the story became for me. But I love just being able to play around and um, make things that are generally entertaining, I guess, for me. Constance? <laughs> So, how many icons were the ones you had for the icons? Oh, many, story? no, many hundreds, many hundreds. Okay, well, that is a very good question. So, scaling things. <laughs> I've been working with this technology for almost 10 years. And one thing you learn is that if you digitize something at a certain size and you save it, you can't change the size of it. Um, because if you rescale it, the stitches don't fill in the right way or they break apart. But I've learned over the years that if I save it in a certain way where it's not actually stitches yet, um, then, I can, then I can scale it. So I save things in different files so that some things are scalable, like this is scalable. But once I've, I've decided that this is my composition and it goes to the machine, it can't be scaled. I'll have to re redo it. So you'll see things that are repeated, but they've been re-digitized several times. So yeah, there, there, there are lots of technical, technical rules. And I look back at the first things that I did, and it's, it's uh, amazing that when you really understand how to do, use the program. I, when I got the program, I thought, I know Photoshop. You just pull down the menus, and then you see what it does. Well, I did that, and nothing worked. I couldn't even make anything happen. So after panicking, I, got, got, I used the yellow pages. And um, I called up a guy in Norwalk who was a commercial embroiderer. I said, can I intern with you? And he's like, sure. So I went down there. It was uh, hundreds of machines all <laughs> And he sat down, and he, he gave me a logos and had to do tiny little letters. And when the good thing about uh, working with a commercial embroiderer, what I did learn, is that you have to, um, you can, digitize things so that you don't have to jump around. You have to put things in a certain order and make sure that it's almost like vacuuming, where you don't want to step on stuff you've already vacuumed. So you have to figure out a route so that you don't jump all over the place. Because if you did that with a tote bag, you'd have to come in and clip all those things, and the machines would have to stop. So it actually taught me some very, very good like, strategies so that they don't because this takes hours to stitch out, hours. And you're changing threads between each, each thing. And some of these have layers and layers of threads on them. But uh, so the resizing, some things I can if I save them correctly. But sometimes I, I wish I had you know, saved the, the, the little, little bits. So these are all machines? Uh, yes. There's, there is no hand stitching on this whatsoever. Even the sequins are stitched down by machine. My machine has a, has a sequin stitch. So I can put the presser foot down, and it will go up, down, side, side. My sewing machine is like a, a, a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> I, it took me five years to pay it off, but it is, it's, it's still a, like a home use machine. It's not a commercial machine, but it, it's mainly made for quilters who do very elaborate quilts. But it reads, it can read uh, these, these programs. So when you say you have them here or you don't have them here, are you seeing that the stitches and the images as you go? Like, ah. you have that image first and then you can step back and look at it and go, oh, I think I would. Well, that's a really good question. So for example, if I had stitched this whole thing down, and it's hooped. You know, you have to put an embroidery hoop, and it's in the machine. 
So if it's still in the machine and this image is still on my screen, I can say, I would like to have some of these shapes in there. I can go, if I've saved them, if I have a file of them, I can go, I can go back and place them in and go back. But because I haven't moved anything, the machine will be calibrated so that all of this is in the same place. So where I place them, they will be. But, that, but if I take the hoop off, I can't do that. So there, you know, there, I've learned to do that because it's been helpful to me. Um, in a way, yes. For example, these, these guys here are applicate on. They're, they were done separately. So after I, I did this, I don't know whether I put those in after I, I sewed these out. I, then I think I went back and I put these guys in. And then after I took the, the, this page off, I went into my studio and I had these already sewn. I cut them out, I stuck them down, and then I sewed them on. So there's, there's lots of decisions that go until it's, till it's right. Um, all of these different paintings on here. If you look, there's all kinds of, this is a multicolored thread around here. Um, the sequins go on probably at the end. But yeah, there's a lot of things that are not, nothing is done until it's, until it's done. I'm, but there are things that I can do in the machine um, while it's in process. But I don't have as many choices as if I had planned it out, planned it out ahead of time. These are little pieces of paintings that I sewed down afterwards. So there's, you know, in the beginning, it was just this yellow piece of, of this yellow painting with these embroideries on it, big yellow thing. And then all of this got put on afterwards. So I've got boxes of, you know, this kind of stuff. So I could say, hmm. So that's how I would, I would think. Does that make it better? So that's the fun part at the end is you can just, you can see it just becomes a whole different painting when you add things on, then I would sew that down. So that's, that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even though you're using a machine, you're, you're using so much as being a part of the that you're doing. And each plan, like you said, has to be done and ready and everything. For you, it is done by hand in the way that you're doing it. Part of your, everything of you goes into the plan. Oh, oh, definitely. And I, I like being able to just keep changing my mind. I come from a, a tech background. My father was a tech writer. He built his own ham radio stuff. We had, we, my brother and I built Morse code keys. We sent code and, you know, a lot of building circuits. And so I, I do love the technical aspect of it. But, you know, these things have, have learning curves. It might not be interesting to other people, but unless I'm doing something like that, I, like what, what, what um, Tom does to stand in front of a painting, a, a thing, like a big white canvas, and then have something and do that. I never, never liked doing that. Never, never, never. Um, so for me, this takes so much of that, you know, that blankness away. I can just go in the studio and make background after background after background. There's stencils on here. There's all kinds of stamps, all kinds of painting and textures. And it's just joyful to do all of these things. It's joyful to program these strange little monsters, whatever the heck it is. And then sewing it out. You know, the hard work is done. Then I just start placing colors of thread, and there's so much fun in it. And then after that's done, then I get to go play in all my scraps and cut stuff and lay it out. So for me, also, you know, growing up, we were, we were pretty poor, and we couldn't really waste anything. So saving scraps, even when I was sewing my clothes, we saved every scrap because you never know where you could 
you know, make a cuff out of it or make something out of it. So this also uh, speaks to my frugality. I never wanted to have to give anything away, you know, like throw anything out that might be useful. So in my box, I have some tiny, tiny little things that become just wonderful little moments of color that come in. This is suminagashi marbling um, that I just put wax on. So this is, there's all kinds of different, I'd say just playful things that then come together into something that I consider, I, I hate to use the word serious, but something that in the end is intentional. But nothing is intentional until it's done. So it's just, never, it's the not knowing, I think, that allows me to not tighten up. My drawings are very precise. And it just, it would stop me cold you know, just do, drawing and getting tighter and tighter and tighter. So I tried to do anything I could to put obstacles in my way. So as my friend Constance here knows, we're both rug hookers. And when you're hooking a rug, you can't really get into details. You have to kind of, you're working with chunky stuff and you have to think differently. You have to think about color differently. Um, so just these obstacles, putting between the drawing and the final piece, there's all of this programming that has to go on. And sometimes you do a program and it's something weird happens that you didn't intend and it's better than you could have thought. So sometimes just the process opens you up to other possibilities rather than it all having to come straight from your head or straight from your observation into your hand. So for me, it's all of those obstacles that I like to slow me down and uh, it's much more enjoyable for me this way. And when, when they're done, I think they're kind of funny. So they entertain me. <laughs> yeah, whimsical. And some of them are a little scary, but some of them I think are pretty funny. They're like, they're like fairy tales. You know, sometimes fairy tales are a little scary. Some of them are a little apocalyptic. But uh, I think in a good way. <laughs> it's, a, it's a happy apocalypse because, you know, people are bouncing around on things. 